Please welcome to the, to the stage David Larwood, Matthew Nelson, and Dylan P.A. that way. So why don't you take that one? Thanks. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, guys. We haven't met Dylan. Matt, nice to meet you. So healthcare is such an important thing. I'm very touched by the stories that we've heard from these people. Uh, my personal story is I had polio as a child. My father had polio at the same time. Uh, polio is acute. It lasts about 10 days. It's like influenza. And then it's done. And you're left with what's left. It causes, ma it causes nerve damage. It eats up your nerves. So I have um, a very weak single leg. My father, uh, we were in, in Korea as medical missionaries, and there was no vaccine available for us. Actually, the vaccine didn't exist anywhere at the time. It was just coming into availability. And um, uh, my father, taking care of his family, stepped in and took care of me. And I, I said to him later, you got polio because you were protecting mother. He denied it. He said we were probably exposed at the same time. But uh, polio, is, as I said, is, is, is brief, um, but then you're basically, okay, you're like, you, you have what you're left with. There, in the old days, there were iron lungs. Now they put you on a ventilator. Less than 1% of people have residual uh, facts like mine. Polio has something that comes in late. Um, I, uh, I have post-polio, so in my late 40s, I started getting weaker and weaker, and I'll have progression until I die. My father, in his last days, was in a wheelchair and, and uh, didn't move very well. I'm very touched by the stories that we heard. My mother died of brain cancer. My wife had breast cancer. In that moment, when you say, what? And you just kind of go blank. I've experienced that. And it's, it's difficult for the individual, but caregivers are very important. I'll tell you one more small thing. I was chatting with Joan. I've, I've been in touch with Joan for a long time in uh, August, and we're talking about COVID. And so I had COVID in July, as did my wife. Uh, mine was fairly brief. It was like a cold. I was you know, sick for three days and got better with some residual. My wife's was tougher. Um, you know, Six weeks later, she was still weak. She's it's now three months, and she's still re residually weak. Um, I mentioned my father in healthcare. I, I'm a, I'm a drug scientist. Uh, I'm pursuing a PhD at UC San Francisco. In my first round, I invented a component of the vaccine. Um, and I uh, studied you know, the, how, how you do these advances and find these diseases. Um, and a final, so I've been pursuing a valley fever for a long time. So I work very closely with the valley fever community. Uh, there's a COXI study group. Somebody mentioned uh, you know, meetings, you know, patient advocacy. The COXI study group has met annually since the middle 50s. My father joined in 1958, uh, and patients come to these meetings, and it's really wonderful to share experiences with others. But enough about me. Dylan, tell, me your, uh, tell us your, 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 your disease story. Uh, sure. So my name is Dylan P.A. I am 29 years old. Uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia. I moved to the Phoenix area to pursue my Ph.D. at ASU. Uh, March of 2021, I... Awoke one morning, surrounded by paramedics, and they told me I had a seizure. Prior to that, I never had any sort of health scare at all. I never even really had to visit the doctor more than the once a year general checkup. And so following that, I was brought to a hospital. They told me it may just be a one-off seizure, quickly released me, and then I was brought back home. And then I actually had another seizure that day. And then they brought me back to the hospital, Luckily, I have mentors that are very, very experienced. My girlfriend contacted some of my mentors, and then they recommended that I be brought to uh, Banner. So I was brought to Banner, and then after some MRIs, uh, EEGs, they told me MRIs seemed fairly clear. They saw some white matter lesions. And as a neuroscientist, it popped in my head, oh, that could be possibly MS, and I asked the doctor, oh, could it be MS? They confirmed they were very, trying to be comforted, comfort me and say, oh no, it's not, chances are it's not MS, don't worry, you don't have any symptoms, See, a seizure could be a rare symptom, but it's likely not. And they also, uh, one of my neurologists was like, but just in case we're gonna give you a spinal tap, check your CSF. And about a week later, received some news with my, they found some oligoclonal banding in my CSF, and then 
spoke with another neurologist and they said, yeah, you have MS, don't worry, no symptoms right now. A seizure is a very rare symptom. It could be, that could be your only seizure that one day that you had seizures. Put me on uh, infusion treatments and kind of sent me on my way. And then in the weeks later, I had multiple seizures, kind of brought back to a hospital and then diagnosed with epilepsy as well. So now I'm kind of facing that kind of battle, finding the right treatment, right medication mixture to, so I can be seizure free. And yeah, that's kind of my overall story. So we'll dig into these stories a little bit, these details a little bit more. Matt, tell us your story, please. Um, so mine started off pretty uneventful. Uh, I came home on a Friday night and mentioned to my wife that my, the left side of my face felt numb. And her first thought was, you're having a stroke. And I said, well, I took my, my learning modules at Dignity Health uh, on stroke, recognizing what a stroke is. I said, it's not a stroke. Don't worry about it. And I'll be fine. I was, you know, not to overgeneralize, I was a typical male. Everything's okay. I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm not going to worry about it. I said, I did acquiesce and say, if it's not any better by tomorrow morning, I'll go to urgent care. I got up in the morning. The numbness was still there. Tried to check in online. They said, we won't. It, essentially, I got a message that said, you can't check in online. Get here right away. Showed up at the urgent care. They rushed me in the back, worked me up for a stroke. They said, well, we don't think you're having a stroke, but we're going to send you to Chandler Regional just to be sure. But we're, and we're going to call you a, an ambulance. And I said, I drove myself here. I think I can take myself to Chandler Regional. I don't have to worry about the ambulance ride. So I drove to Chandler Regional. I showed up, and they're calling me over the intercom trying to find me. Once I walked in, I said, that I'm here. And they rushed me back, worked me up for the stroke diagnosis, they couldn't find anything either. Um, they said, we don't know what's going on, but we're going to uh, refer you to a neurologist. Um, that was on Saturday. I happened to work at Barrow and, and Dignity Health, so I, in, in my role there in, in research, uh, I reached out to uh, one of the physicians that I knew, and I said, I've got this weird diagnosis. Can you get me in? Um, and it was just an email, so I didn't hear back. On Sunday, this is kind of an odd aspect, but um, I was at a hotel with my kids and my family, and we were jumping from the hot tub to the pool, and it was cold. And every time I got into the hot tub, um, I felt really sick, and I felt really fatigued. And then I'd get in the, in the pool, and it would go away. And then I would jump back in, and after three or four times, I was like, I, I got to go lay down. And I led with that story um, on Monday when I got in to see a neurologist at, uh, at, at Barrow. And they said, you know, that's, that's an interesting aspect. We're, we're, we're not really sure what's going on. And I said to the doctor, I said, my wife's not going to let me back in the house unless I get an MRI order. <laughs> so they got me in to, for an MRI the next day. Um, and that was Tuesday. And, um, on Wednesday, I, I met with the physician again, and culminating the MRI results and the experience I had in the hot tub, they said, you have MS. Um, I had a number of lesions on my brain. Um, it was kind of shocking at the moment because I had gone through my whole life being pretty free of any sickness or I hardly ever got sick, no colds, no flus, no nothing. Um, but it's, since then, it's been uh, a, a journey in, in that regards. Uh, went through a, a week of, um, uh, sorry, I get brain locked every once in a while, of uh, steroid infusions to bring the inflammation down. Um, I've been on a, a preventative uh, therapy for the last seven years. Everything seems to be OK, um, although I did have a new lesion develop. Uh, during a bout of COVID uh, back in June. Not really sure if it's because of the COVID or because of the MS, but I still have some follow-up to do on that. So uh, I'm going to share one more story because when Joan and I were talking, we were looking for a valley fever person. So since I 
see a lot of valley fever cases, I'll just touch on that because it fits this profile. Um, as you probably know, valley fever is a spore. We could be in here. We're, we're at risk right here. I mean, simply living in Phoenix, being in Phoenix for moments, you're at risk. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, but if you're unlucky, you get the disease. It gets worse. For most people, they get better. For about a few people, progress. And I have a friend in Bakersfield who has it in his brain. He suffered it for a long time, and it's really terrible. He has a, he has a, a, he, his therapy is a, an infusion thing that he gets refilled uh, once a week or so that drips drug into his brain. So these are different forms of therapy. One of the things Joan wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about was how your, how your experiences influenced your perspective of the healthcare system. Oh uh, yeah, certainly. So I. I'm finally starting to realize how much, how important it is for patients to kind of be their own advocate. I think originally, kind of early on, my diagnosis with epilepsy, I kind of just accepted the treatments that they gave me. My seizures weren't, the frequency wasn't really changing with my early treatments. And luckily, again, mentors that had that experience really informed me that I have to be my, I have to really fight my own fight. So it's really important that, like originally I, was, I had no rescue med that they gave me, so it was just kind of, kind of up to me. But after learning that, okay, patients do have to be their own advocate is really one of the most crucial aspects, I think. And, and to add to that, if, if you can't be your own advocate, you need to have an advocate with you. Um, Dylan and I have a six degrees of Kevin Bacon in a sense, so one of his advocates is my wife, who was a big advocate for me during this whole process. Um, and it's, it's, there is a, a degree of getting the information from the physician, and there's a degree of getting the information yourself online, and then being able to process that. Uh, one thing that I would, I thought of as I was listening to the stories was that with the initial diagnosis, there was a state of shock, and I wasn't really in a state of mind where I, felt like I could make good decisions and having somebody there with you to help you process that information I think is really important. So it's interesting that we have this, all three of us have this deep connection to the, to the healthcare system. You're connected with the hospital. I'm, I'm not sure if you're a science medical person, it's not important. Um, but well, I'll, I'll ask you whether being around the healthcare system made it a little easier to process when you were going through this? Oh, it's absolutely easier. Um, the Barrow Neurology Clinic is right across the street, so I can go over there for neuro PT. I can go down eight flights of stairs to get my MRI, and then I can go back to work afterwards. So it's, it makes it really easy. To that, I would say that uh, having access to the healthcare um, makes it a big difference. You know, you don't want to be driving a couple hours away to get your, your treatment. You want to, if it's possible, to live in the community where you can get that treatment or at least have that resource available to you. Telehealth makes a big difference as well. So I spent a lot of time speaking at conferences about clinical trials, because I'm advancing a drug and I have to go through clinical trials and learn a lot about uh, telehealth and things like that. And you know, if you were in um, some remote section of the of the state, uh, you know that you know living in town or eight flights away from from where your treatment is, or or a couple block, you know, very close by, uh, makes a huge difference. Um, but same with your experience. You're a neuroscientist. Are you still studying this? Yes, I'm uh, completing my PhD right now. Yeah. So I, I recall hearing uh, somebody spoke yesterday at White Hat or perhaps the day before about, uh, yeah, it was White, White Hat. When somebody in your family has a, a, a particularly a rare and devastating disease uh, and you have an opportunity to do research and help with that, where's that led you? Uh, so yeah, certainly my research that I conduct right now, it's very, it's preclinical. I focus on how chronic stress impacts the brain, but it definitely has, like my diagnosis has kind of made me really want to head more towards the translational route and really be able to really make that impact on people. I feel like what I'm doing right now, it, although it someday it will impact people, I really want to have that impact now. And Matt, your wife was uh, the, the caregiver thing. I mentioned that earlier. You know, if it's happening to you, that's tough. But if it's happening to a loved one, it's almost harder because you see you have a different perspective on it. How did your wife come to be? You know, the, how did she get informed? Did she? You know, there there are people that get just so 
intensely into this, and I think of the Kavanaugh's as, as a perfect example. Like, we have a problem in our family. We're just going to study the heck out of this thing. How did how did that evolve in your system? That would describe my wife to a T. She's she knows where to get the information. Um, it, both good and bad. We we all have a tendency to doom scroll, which you have to be careful of. But she can she can find the information. She can uh, she's ingrained in the neuroscience community here as well. So. Uh, between the two of us, we were able to find the right, the right combination of things to do. So we only have a couple minutes left. Do um, you have some closing thoughts on what we could do better? Why don't we start with Matt this time? Um, the, the health community and then, then the system generally. Sure. Uh, you know, one thing that we're starting to do in the research environment at Barrow is uh, we have a new MS researcher that came in, in in August, and one of the things that she's bringing to the table and that I see a lot of value is, is to set up a biobank of samples from patients. And she's going to focus on MS. And it's not only just in coordination with clinical trials, because you want to bank those samples as well, but it's also from the research perspective and the federal funding that can come in and the National Sci uh, MS Society funding that could come in to study those banks of samples. It's really important to have a longitudinal aspect to follow somebody over the course of a disease progression because they don't really have a whole lot of markers to go after with MS research. And have you been genome sequenced? Is that, did that come up? I have not. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say the kind of the awareness aspect, really making sure that the entire community knows which areas will really you can find the best help. I think I was really fortunate that I had, again, I had Matt's wife that really was able to point me in the right direction. But if I weren't, if I hadn't had that, I don't know really where I would have gone to find the help that I needed. Um, so I'll, I'll comment on the longitudinal stuff. You know, finding something that's subtle before it shows up is tricky. Uh, I'm participating in, I think, four clinical trials at Stanford, which is not far from where I live on uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so it's called the aging brain study. So they were looking for people that showed no symptoms. Uh, so that if, if you, if you uh, develop symptoms at some point, can you rewind and say what changed and when and why? Uh, and I'll, I'll reinforce a couple of, of things that we talked about. Stress makes you more susceptible to disease because your, your body is this very finely tuned system. It's amazing how strong it is. My brother, Tried to cut his leg off one time, accidentally bled out twice, uh, and it just reminded me that the smallest thing the body can correct for it. He's, you, you wouldn't know it now, um, but the body corrects amazingly, and yet all these disease states, you know, it can't quite get them all tuned up again. Anyway, the longitudinal study, they checked me now, and I think I'm six, six or seven years into this thing. So they said, oh, you did that one. Why don't you do this Parkinson's one? Okay, why don't you do this other one? Looking at mental acuity and things like that for what are the first signs. So I don't think we, I mean, even though genomic screening is getting cheaper, I don't think you can screen everybody for everything. Uh, but uh, doing these tests early on, since we have the tools now, your experience was uh, 15 years ago, they weren't doing it then. Uh, but now if there's if there's somebody's coming in with presenting with symptoms like ALS or a cancer disease, do a pretty full screen, you know, that might, could be families, all kinds of stuff. So I think we have to wrap that up. I think we've probably gone over. Uh, Joan, thank you as always. Dylan, Matt, uh, Please share your experiences with others.